It is our pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Ray Crabe, who's a professor of history at Cornell University to be as our speaker today. Um, we, he will speak to us for about 30, 35 minutes. We will have uh, opportunity for a lively uh, discussion uh, and a Q&A period at, at this mic uh, afterward for about 20 minutes. Uh, Jeff Shumway, uh, who is our coordinator for Latin American Studies, will introduce Professor Crabe. Uh, hello, everyone. Good morning, uh, or good afternoon now. Um, let's just really quickly, for uh, Dr. Crabe's benefit, how many of you are not from Utah in here? Okay, so I guess we should have asked who's from Utah. But anyway, just he wanted to know like where everybody's from. Is anybody from where he lit close in, from New York, state of New York in here? Just one? And you're kind of by him, right? Where are you from? Or a couple? All right, so we got... Uh, Anyway, how many of you speak Spanish or Portuguese? So a lot. Other languages matter, but we'll just, <laughs> we'll just start with that. Uh, Dr. Raymond Crabe grew up in a variety of places, uh, the UK, Spain, New Mexico, uh, lived in Hawaii as well, went to school in Eastern Michigan, then got his MA at University of New Mexico and his PhD at Yale. In Dr. Crabe's own words, his research and teaching interests revolve around the intersections of space, politics, and everyday practice. He is, the, he is the author of three books, Cartographic Mexico, uh, A History of State Fixations and Fugitive, Fugitive Landscapes, published with Duke. Also, The Cry of the Renegade, Politics and Poetry in, in, in Interwar Chile, published with Oxford. And the forthcoming, it was supposed to come out yesterday on Amazon, but pandemic delays, it's coming out in June. Uh, Adventure Capitalism, A History of Libertarian Exit from the Era of Decolonization to the Digital Age. As you can tell by this brief introduction, he has books on North America, South America, and now the Pacific and the world, the rest of the world. Dr. Crabe is a world traveler and an expansive thinker. A few years ago, I listened to him give a presentation uh, in which he talked about settlement schemes on the reefs in the South Pacific Kingdom of Tonga. And I knew that anyone who can combine Latin America and Polynesian reefs into a presentation needed to come to campus. So <laughs> we're glad that we can have him. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. I really appreciate the, the introduction, and uh, hopefully you're not blinded by the lights shining off of my forehead. Um, I'll start just by thanking a few people. I'd like to thank Kelly Russell, uh, Quinn Meekham, uh, Paul Guajardo, uh, and the yet-to-be-met to Nathan Hunsecker um, for uh, supporting uh, my visit. Uh, I'm very appreciative of that, and I'd like to thank Jeff uh, Shumway uh, for the invitation uh, to come. It's been a long time since I've been in the Intermountain West. I was at New Mexico for two years back in the 90s and uh, walking out the, ho the hotel this morning and looking at the mountains was just in the sky, just it was absolutely glorious, I have to say. It's just spectacular and it feels very good. Um, so uh, I get kind of animated, so I'm going to try to stay close by the microphone. Um, but yeah, the inequality of freedom, libertarian exit strategies from decolonization to the digital age. Let's see if I can get this to... Try one more time. There we go. Uh, yeah. So, um, why the inequality of freedom? The title uh, of my talk. I thought it was a title and a series of issues that might uh, productively engage the theme of global inequality. What does it mean to be free? Is there a relationship between freedom and equality? Is there a relationship between democracy and social solidarity uh, and the like? And these are long-standing questions, of course, long-standing questions that have been taken up by John Locke, by, by Rousseau, by Smith, by Marx, by Bakunin, uh, amongst, um, amongst many uh, others, all of them trying to explore in some form or another the relationship between the individual and uh, the social. My interest in these things comes from uh, how they reemerged with force in uh, the post-World War II era and with the defeat of fascism. And what is particularly interesting to me is the uh, recasting or the kind of discussion that developed over the course of the 1950s and the 1960s 
uh, regarding freedom and its relationship to totalitarianism and where the question of equality or social solidarity fit into uh, that conversation. Uh, this is, of course, things that were taken up uh, with great gusto by various writers from across the political spectrum. Eric Fromm, uh, famously 1942 book Escape from Freedom, which is, was his effort to explain uh, the rise of totalitarianism in Germany as a kind of uh, effort to escape from the freedom of responsibility, of making choices, of realizing that the world is filled with anxiety, right, and instead to run towards demagoguery, right, so an escape from freedom. Uh, or put in perhaps more, more uh, poignant or succinct ways by Arthur Schlesinger in the United States, and when, when he said totalitarian man is a man without anxiety. To assuage anxiety, uh, one could argue, as a sort of insurance policy against revolution, uh, social programs were put into place, starting with the New Deal, of course, in the wake of the Great Depression in the United States, which was ongoing after the war, but also in things like post-war uh, lending programs, building up home ownership, generating what, by all measures, must be the, the most productive uh, creation of a middle class uh, in uh, global history in the United States after uh, the war. The image you see here is Orange County in the 1950s, and of course Orange County, Southern California, was nothing but farmland in the 1920s and the 1930s, and of course by the early 1960s it had massively expanded in size because in part of state inputs, government inputs in terms of aeronautic industries, military industrial complex, uh, and so on and so forth, but also because of subsidies and supports for housing programs uh, as well. Now, interestingly enough, uh, at the same time that you have this uh, assuaging of anxiety uh, and these um, questions around the relationship between freedom and totalitarianism, you also have a simultaneous growth in U.S. libertarianism. And when I say libertarianism, let me just see. Oops. Okay, here we go. Uh, when I say libertarianism, I just want to explain very quickly what I mean. In most of the world, libertarian is synonymous with anarchist. Anarchist is essentially both anti-state but also anti-capitalist. Uh, and when I'm talking about libertarianism here, I'm talking about a U.S. strain of libertarianism, which is market libertarianism. So it's generally anti-statist, uh, but not anti-capitalist. It's hyper-capitalist. Uh, and I've just given you some characteristics here to think about just to kind of orient the conversation, uh, and by no means is this sort of, you know, the sort of definitive uh, position on this, but this is how I sort of structure things to make sense of the material that I'm looking at. But libertarian, no relation to anarchism. Uh, I think anarcho-capitalism is something of a misleading term because you're putting two contradictions together. It's hyper-capitalist. You can think of people like uh, Murray Rothbard on one end of the spectrum, but also Ayn Rand, uh, Milton Friedman, uh, these are individuals, Hayek, von Mises, amongst others, but these are individuals who shared to some degree some worldviews that I think you can put under an umbrella term of libertarian, even if at moments they sort of rejected the term, right, in some sense. But one was a disdain for the welfare and regulatory state, right? uh, but not the state per se. Right. All of them made room for Rothbard less than others, but all of the rest of the individuals here made room for a night watchman state, a minimalist state, an ultra minimalist state that arguments around what, what that should look like. And by minimalism, it's important to understand that they did not mean that the state should be smaller. What they meant was the state should be limited in its functions. Right? It should be limited in its functions. Its budget might be enormous. Uh, it might have an enormous amount of power, uh, but its, its functions should be limited to things like national defense, policing, protection of property rights, uh, patent law, uh, and so on uh, and so forth. Right? That was to be the role of the sort of minimalist uh, state. Uh, they also shared a, a radical embrace of a very amorphous notion of free enterprise, but the basic gist behind this was to make markets rather than states sovereign, right? So sovereignty lies with the market. The state exists to ensure the sovereignty of the markets rather than vice versa, right? Which is how we live now. Uh, a fetishization of the individual rather than the social. So the starting position was always the individual autonomous sovereign subject, regardless of the sort of social world within which they uh, operated, and there's, there's a heavy influence of John Locke in that position. Um, a fear of the masses. Uh, many of these were individuals who had to leave 
Germany in the 1920s and the 1930s, uh, or in certain cases had to flee uh, Stalinist Russia. So there's a fear of the masses based on uh, their experiences with totalitarianism. What is interesting is the way in which their understanding of totalitarianism changed over time in the 1950s and the 1960s. Uh, that is to say, there was a conflation over the course of time of communism, socialism, and fascism, all as equal and similar forms of uh, totalitarianism, right? um, which is, in some sense, both understandable but both problematic, in part because when you get to the 1960s, as I'll talk about in just a second, uh, you end up uh, in a situation uh, in which uh, totalitarianism is seen as happening in some parts of the political spectrum, but not others. Okay, and I'll come back to that in just a minute. And then the last point uh, that I think they all shared in common was an ontology, a kind of way of understanding basic principles of the world uh, that equated individual property rights with freedom, right? This is sort of foundational point of freedom had to do with uh, individual property rights. In the 1960s, uh, a lot of the fears around totalitarianism and concerns about a, a kind of return to uh, what was unfolding in the 20s and the, and the, and the 30s worldwide uh, erupted. And so you have fears of things like demographic collapse, ecological collapse, or monetary collapse. These are just three of the many you could uh, choose. And you can see here I just put in a random few of the texts, but there's tons and tons of these. But The Population Bomb by Paul and Ann Ehrlich. It actually says Dr. Paul Ehrlich, but he actually wrote it with his wife, Ann, but he, she didn't get any credit. Um, and this was a, this was a text that, that essentially forecast enormous strife and chaos in the 1970s if something wasn't done about population. Uh, Garrett Hardin's uh, 1968 essay, The Tragedy of the Commons, uh, similarly had this perspective around uh, common use rights, uh, uh, demography, uh, and so on and so forth. He later espoused what would be called lifeboat ethics about what to do in terms of demand on resources by too many people. Uh, Make Room, Make Room by Harry Harrison, 1966, I believe. Uh, you probably better know it as the foundation or the text that, uh, that gave rise to the movie Soylent Green with Charlton Heston, 1973. Uh, if you haven't seen Soylent Green, now's a good time to see it because it takes place, the film takes place in, 19, in 2022. So, um, so prepare yourself. You'll never look at a, you know, a, a, a impossible burger again the same. Um, Ian Fleming's Goldfinger, uh, right, 1959, the film was made in 1964, but it's all about gold. It's all about metals and the concern about demographic or, or about monetary collapse. Right? And so already in the 60s, there were gold bugs who would go on the Phil Donahue show and so on and so forth to advocate for investing in metals right? rather than relying upon paper money. And there's a, a significant concern over the course of time. And of course, the U.S. eventually delinks from the gold standard under Nixon. Uh, and as gold skyrockets in value, and a lot of people who had invested in the 60s in gold really made a lot of money. And they would push a lot of the projects along that, uh, that I'm talking about. Just very quickly, so in the midst of the social movement struggles of the 1960s, uh, things like the civil rights movement, right? things like the Great Society uh, of Johnson, things like the ongoing New Deal uh, programs that have been put into place by Roosevelt, things like uh, the Chicano nationalist movement uh, in the US Southwest, uh, the second wave feminism, uh, and so forth. These are social movements that create an appearance or a fear right, that the world is turning in the way that it turned in the 20s and the 30s. So for some of these individuals that I look at, right, their response to, to these movements is one in which they fear for their, their wealth, they fear for their safety, uh, and so on, right. And so they uh, decide to, in fact, try to exit uh, the country and create their own private states, right. And that's the sort of foundation from which uh, my work uh, takes off. I'm interested in what seem like very marginal projects, very sort of uh, somewhat strange projects, projects that have often been subjected to, you know, ridicule and yuck, yuck, and, you know, this kind of stuff. Um, and I'm not a huge fan of these projects. I can be very blunt about that. Um, but they are revealing, right? They are revealing of things, of patterns in the past, of things that are happening historically and also happening today that I think are important to make sense of and be curious about rather than just to uh, dismiss them. 
So exit, a uh, little Matt Damon, just in case you get bored of looking at me. Um, <laughs> well, minus the, minus the tats. Um, that's from the movie Elysium, right, which, is, which, which has this kind of feel to it. Um, so the idea behind exit, just very quickly, is to leave the nation state and create a new sovereign community that's run, at least for the people I look at, largely, almost entirely along uh, transactional market relations. Very few things, there, there would be governance, but there wouldn't be anything that we would necessarily recognize as a state. Everything would be generated through contract and agreement. Right? This was what they referred to as a moral experiment. It's not merely about tax havenry, saving money, avoiding the IRS. Uh, these are individuals who had enough money that they could afford tax accountants. They could you know, get their money into the Cayman Islands and so forth. That's not what it was about for them. It was a moral experiment to realize in their mind what they felt was the means to reach uh, a, a fuller idea of freedom. Right? So in this instance, the, the entrepreneurial and the moral uh, are not mutually exclusive uh, in their minds. And I think that's important to keep in mind. Exit is not just uh, a means right, to realize an idea of freedom, but exit itself is part of the principle uh, of being free, that you have the right to opt into and opt out of societies with the ease of a consumer, uh, effectively. There's a long history to these uh, ideas. One could go back in time quite substantially. I think there's something to be said about looking at things like the company states uh, of the early modern era as uh, forms of private sovereignty in certain kinds of ways that mimic some of the things that, that people are talking about. Wakefield's uh, New Zealand colonization company, I think, is probably the closest um, uh, in many ways. Um, and then you have varied attempts to create private kingdoms um, in the 19th century in particular. So the man who would be king, Rudyard Kipling's famous um, short story, uh, made into a film again in the 1970s with um, Sean Connery and Michael, uh, Michael Caine. Uh, Gregor McGregor in Honduras in the wake of uh, the decolonization movements of the 1820s in Latin America and the Brooke family of Sarawak, amongst uh, many others. And of course, many parts of Africa were actually initially colonized through private contract, right? The states came in after the fact in many instances. Not always, but there was lots of private contract negotiation going on uh, as well. So I'm just going to give you very quickly, uh, in the 1960s and 1970s, someone I look closely at uh, is a man by the name of Michael Oliver. His birth name was Moses Olitsky. He was from Lithuania. He was Jewish. He was the only member of his family to survive the Holocaust. He was a teenager. Uh, he came to the United States after World War II, settled in Nevada, and uh, actually became quite a wealthy man through both real estate and also because he owned a coin exchange uh, and invested in gold. He was one of the gold bugs that, that I was talking about. And Michael Oliver, in 1968, publishes a book called A New Constitution for a New Country. And it's self-published but it sells out immediately. This is a kind of, it's a moment uh, in, in many respects. This is a real resonant moment where a lot of these ideas are taking off. Uh, so it sells out, republishes it, and in the meantime, he has people coming and investing. Pretty prominent people, uh, John Hosper is a, a philosophy professor at the University of Southern California, um, Willard Garvey, who was a wheat magnate from Kansas, and also the head of um, World Homes. He was building, uh, uh, homes for the, for the poor in uh, parts of Peru. Uh, Seth Atwood, who was a very famous watch collector, watchmaker, and, and a yachtman uh, from a very wealthy background in Illinois. Uh, John Templeton, uh, if you listen to NPR, every once in a while you're here, they say we're sponsored by the Templeton Foundation. That's the John Templeton, right? So there were a lot of people investing uh, in, these, in these projects. Uh, also, I should just mention uh, Thaddeus Weed, who was the inventor of the Weed tennis racket and also the place kicker for the Ohio State University football team in 1954 when they went undefeated. I mean, just, you know, it's marvelous, the array of people. Um, and so they're all involved and they're investing in these projects. And the first project is the one that Jeff actually mentioned uh, in his introduction, his very kind introduction, which is the Minerva Reefs in uh, the South Pacific. So this is Tonga here. Ata is the southernmost, uh, actually I can look on my screen here, I guess, but Ata is the southernmost uh, outcropping island uh, in, in Tonga. It used to be inhabited, it's not anymore. The, the residents of Ata moved back to uh, the main islands of Tonga in, in the late 19th century because they were being uh, subjected to slave raids by Peruvian ships all the way from across the South Pacific. Uh, but these are the Minerva Reefs. And the Minerva Reefs are an atoll. They sit under the water, not above the water, 23 hours a day. Uh, 
And uh, Michael Oliver's idea was to uh, dredge the atoll, pile the sand on top of the reef, uh, and then actually build a, f uh, a city, a fixed city, for about 30,000 people. And he, he did this through an organization he called the Ocean Life Research Foundation. This was not well received by, uh, by the King of Tonga at the time, uh, and they put a stop to it. This is in 1972. Uh, the reason I have this map here, this is a map from a Maori intellectual. Uh, his name was Terangi Hiroa. Uh, he also went by the name Peter Buck. Uh, and um, I include this because it gives you a sense of how to think about the ocean as not just a smattering of islands but in fact the ocean and land as jointly territorial or parts of people's awareness of territoriality, right? So the idea that these Minerva reefs are somehow uninhabited and open just to be colonized ignores a long history of open ocean navigation, use rights, uh, intermittent uh, settlement patterns, and, and so forth. It pays very little respect to Oceanians and their own sense of their history themselves and, and so forth, okay? So I just wanted to kind of include that. This is a coin that Michael Oliver minted, um, the Republic of Minerva, and it's got the longitude and latitude uh, here, and minted in 1973, a year after uh, the, the venture went down the tubes. Uh, his next project was not to build an island, but to try to colonize one, and that meant the Abaco Archipelago in the north of the Bahamas. Um, this is a pretty disturbing project. Uh, there was a group of people on Abaco who wanted to remain part of the United Kingdom and did not want to uh, leave and decolonize and become part of the Bahamas. Uh, there's a lot of racial politics involved in this because the leadership of the Bahamas was uh, the, the, the party that would come into power, Walter Pindling, uh, was going to be entirely black. Uh, and many of the inhabitants of Abaco, in fact, uh, were not shy about expressing their racism uh, in this regard. But Oliver found himself pulled into a very strange world uh, that included this man, Mitchell Livingston Werbel III, who I could talk about for, for days on end. Um, he was a former OSS operative with E. Howard Hunt, who went on to become a Watergate plumber, with Lucien Conane, who was the point man for the Kennedy administration's assassination of Ziem in South Vietnam, then later went on to direct the DEA the 1970s, amongst many others. But uh, essentially, again, this project failed, but the idea was to take over Abaco uh, and privatize it entirely, hand out shares uh, of uh, land to the inhabitants of Abaco, and also then set up a kind of free trade zone similar to the one that already existed in uh, Grand Bahama and Freeport that had been set up mm -hmm. by Al Capone's uh, colleague and tax accountant, Meyer Lansky, right, uh, much previous. This project uh, also fell apart because the folks in Abaco decided ultimately that they didn't want to run the risk of allying themselves with people that they perceived to be mercenaries. The last project was in the New Hebrides in Santo Island. This is Vanuatu. It's now called Vanuatu. It became Vanuatu in 1980. But the New Hebrides uh, was jointly colonized by the French and the British in the early 20th century. Here, uh, Oliver and another, uh, a couple of other uh, investors uh, attempted to insinuate themselves into uh, a movement to detach uh, from uh, the archipelago uh, by the northern the island of Santo here, which was primarily French speaking, uh, and to detach from the southern portion of the island as it moved towards independence in uh, 1980. Uh, this was uh, a project that actually ended uh, not just disastrously, but also tragically because there were deaths. Uh, troops from Papua New Guinea had to be called in to put down the rebellion in the north. Huge numbers of Ni Vanuatu, native Vanuatu people from Santo who didn't agree with the rebellion were expelled from the island and displaced. Uh, there's an ongoing memory about uh, these things there. And actually, when I, went, when I did research in Vanuatu, uh, it was very touchy that I needed to be uh, cautious right, about uh, who I was talking to, how I was talking to them about this, uh, and about Oliver himself, who still is, to this day is remembered in, in Vanuatu um, uh, for his projects and subsequent uh, interests. So that's some of, these are some of the projects that were happening in the 60s and 70s. Then they begin to disappear in the 1980s, and in part they begin to disappear because there is a kind of 
formalization of the gradual neoliberal revolution that's taking place in the 60s and the 70s under Thatcher and Reagan uh, in particular, and people can begin to socially secede. You don't have to go through all of this, you know, this difficulty of trying to create another territory and so on and so forth. There's lots of different ways now that you can actually uh, uh, secede internally in some sense, not politically secede, but in a way you can kind of right, withdraw from the larger social uh, polity. You see this happen in a wide uh, variety of ways. And then you have contemporary projects. So projects start to come back in the 2000s. And I just want to talk about two uh, briefly here. One is seasteading and the other is free private cities. And uh, I'll just try to finish this up in about seven minutes or so. These are projects that I look at, but, uh, but I don't spend as much time on. Uh, I was really interested in the more historical stuff, but I did want to pay attention to these because they are projects that resonate uh, with Michael Oliver's projects. Michael Oliver has actually written and talked about uh, in a lot of the exit communities coming out of Silicon Valley. So these are projects linked to Silicon Valley. They're inspired less by fears of totalitarianism, which is what inspired Oliver, uh, and more by a kind of Promethean desire to bend reality to one's uh, will. And in some sense, uh, you know, I put here, they're inspired by the more Nietzschean side of Ayn Rand's uh, intellectual work. Um, it's futuristic, but in some ways it's more analog than digital in the sense that they're still concerned with territory, they're still concerned with sovereignty. Uh, they're not, you know, the, the people I'm talking about here are not people who are looking to kind of translate their consciousness into digital code. Uh, or, you know, so if you think of Neuromancer by Gibson or you think of Walk Away by Cory Doctorow or any of the great sci-fi, Neil Stephenson and others, right? The, those, right, those are things that are projecting in different directions. These are much more sort of territorial projects that are quite recognizable, legible, I think, to us. And these are next phases, I think, in a kind of neoliberal to libertarian uh, revolution. These are not merely about social uh, secession, uh, but they're also uh, efforts to continue to try to explore territorial secession uh, as well. And you can see this in, you know, private gated communities, common interest developments, privatization of services, this constant navigation between the state and the private and trying to figure out what the relationship is with the state in terms of provisions of services uh, and so on uh, and so forth. So seasteading, this is a, this isn't a real picture obviously, right? This is a, this is a sort of projection. Uh, I'll show you a real picture in a second. Um, but this is a projection. Uh, seasteading started in 2008 with, uh, with Patrie Friedman, who is the grandson of Milton Friedman, um, and with Peter Thiel, a, a $500,000 uh, angel investment from uh, very famous Silicon Valley iconoclast Peter Thiel. And they created the Seasteading Institute in 2008. And the idea here was how to create uh, a sovereign floating platform on the high seas. They've run into a lot of trouble. One is, is legally, the status of the high seas is not entirely clear. Right, what constitutes an artificial island, floating versus ballast, or ballasted versus fixed anchor, and so on and so forth. Um, but there's interpretations of legal theory, but the thing that really tanked uh, their efforts on the high seas was actually labor costs. If you're way out, far from shore, uh, labor costs are, are extraordinary. Uh, and you can have a huge amount of money, but you're still going to f confront absolutely remarkable uh, labor costs. Um, Seasteading has been influenced a little bit by uh, some writing, um, The Sovereign Individual, a very important 1997 text by Jacob Rees-Mogg, uh, a British baron, uh, and, um, and uh, another journalist, they wrote it together, um, that essentially looks at states as glorified protection rackets and suggests that in fact you just make your own private protection racket, right, that that's what you need to do. Um, there's a kind of neo-reactionary movement associated with this as well uh, that I won't go into detail about, but that comes out of a lot of sort of computer uh, tech uh, writing as well um, and the like. But these are essentially, the, the point is these are, these are efforts or uh, forms of thinking that are pushing past the idea of democracy or democratic politics, however you want to construe that, into something much different, monopoly capitalism, neo-feudalism, uh, and the like. Seasteading also has an ecological pitch, uh, climate refugees in the Pacific, uh, when sea levels rise, what's going to happen? Uh, seasteads might be a way for people to uh, find uh, a way to stay in Oceania or near their, their, their homes. Uh, how that exactly would work is quite difficult because as you can tell, this is gonna be very, very expensive to build, very expensive to invest in, and the idea that, that 
you know, seasteaders uh, are going to open up their, their four-bedroom floating platform to climate refugees is, is a bit uh, overly optimistic, I think. Uh, let's see. There's seasteading the current reality, uh, somewhat different. Uh, this was a um, platform off the coast of Thailand that didn't go well. I won't go into detail about that. Oops. Uh, let's see. I'll just finish up. Free private cities in Honduras. Um, also known as char charter cities. Charter cities and free private cities are slightly distinct, but I'll just put them together here for a minute. Uh, charter cities were the idea of Paul Romer, a very important economist, won the Nobel Prize in economics, famous for what's known as endogenous growth theory. I won't go into detail about that now. Uh, he was also briefly chief economist at the World Bank. Um, but he was looking at ways to get around the problems with classical forms of aid, that development aid never seems to work the way it's supposed to work. So why not instead go to a place like Honduras or Madagascar and so on and so forth, have uh, governments cede portions, uh, a piece of territory, uh, to a group, uh, an international oversight board, right? But in ceding the territory, you're ceding sovereignty over the territory for a 99 year lease, 200 year lease, hard to know, but you're ceding that territory, which will have its own police force, its own judiciary, its arbitration boards, uh, and so on uh, and, and so forth. Uh, but the idea here was competitive governance, how to make governments compete with one another and that in doing so they'll attract right, people that want to live in a place that's nicer than this place, we'll go to that place and so on and so forth. So it's applying a market model or market rationality to the idea uh, of governance. This eventually was turned into what became known as ZEDES, you can see the acronym there, Economic Development Zones. Uh, these took place in Honduras in the wake of uh, a coup d'etat. So Romer initially went to Madagascar and he was doing quite well in navigating and negotiating the possibility of creating a charter city there and there was a coup and that put an end to his uh, efforts in Madagascar. That same year there was a coup in Honduras which revitalized uh, his uh, efforts. But the important point is is that a coup regime is an illegal regime. Uh, and so what was happening in Honduras was a negotiation with essentially an illegitimate uh, regime that stacked the courts and stacked the Congress in such a way to ensure that ZEDE legislation would pass. And it's been ongoing, deeply controversial, deeply conflictual, especially in the midst of an era in which a huge number of, of people in Honduras have had to flee the country right, and head north. Um, a number of people are involved in, in the ZEDEs. You can see here again, uh, Patrick Friedman, Michael Strong, and others, uh, a lot of officials that worked in the Reagan administration uh, on uh, Central American affairs in the 1980s, which was a pretty difficult time for Central America vis-a-vis uh, -vis the United States. Um, also involved Grover Norquist, anti-tax pledge guy, Mark Klugman, uh, who was a speechwriter for Reagan and also worked with Jose Pineda, who was the labor uh, administrator for the Pinochet regime in, um, in Chile, and Mark Skousen, actually the nephew of Cleon Skousen here from Utah, uh, and was an international investor uh, and, and was involved in a variety of things too. And then there's also the Atlas Foundation uh, as well. This is an image from opponents, clearly opponents of the Zetes, right, as a kind of land grab, right? This is the sort of thing that they're getting at. Rotan Prospera is the one that is supposed to be going forward on the Bay Islands off the coast of Honduras. It's not clear now if that's going to go forward anymore because uh, there was recently an election in Honduras in which the opposition uh, finally um, was recognized to have won. They won previously, but it was illegitimately uh, overturned. Um, in the interest of time, I won't go through all of this, but you know things like palm oil plantations and, and Jatropha oil seed, these are the big drivers uh, in some ways of a lot of the land grabs that are going on that are actually interacting with the ZAs in certain kinds of ways. You can see the advisory board here. All, it's all male. Right? This is not uh, un uncommon in some of these uh, projects either. So let me just conclude. I just want to say a few things here. Speculative nonfiction. Um, so a lot of these are projects that I see as where imaginative, you know, sort of science fiction meets, meets nonfiction. Right? Uh, it's where imaginative and investment futures uh, come together. Because in many instances, these are investment. These are venture capitalism, right? Or adventure capitalism, uh, as the way I put it in the book. Um, libertarian states, there's not a contradiction here, right? Uh, again, it's not about the state per se, it's about the sort of size and role of the state. Uh, who exits? And this is where we get to questions of equality and inequality. Who has the right to exit? Who has the right to remain? But who has the means to exit, economic means to exit? And who has the ability uh, to uh, remain? Exit is expensive, right? Both for those who, who buy in and, and for those who, uh, who uh, 
cannot. Right? So in the 1960s and the 1970s, these projects created turmoil. They, they were very costly uh, for the government of Pindling in the Bahamas. They were very costly for the government of Walter Linney in Vanuatu. They sapped resources. They caused turmoil. Um, and then, of course, you have technologies today, extraction of lithium and threats about making, you know, supporting a coup d'etat in Bolivia and so forth in the interest of extracting lithium so that you can make your Tesla batteries, right? So private ex outsources its costs onto uh, the public. Um, this means exit is not a neutral act. Mike Davis, urban theorist Mike Davis, the only realistic scenario uh, in which climate change, just to take one example, is addressed equitably such that the worst consequences are not borne by the poor and uh, by future generations is one in which the wealthy do not have a preferential exit option. And the key I want to stress here is preferential, not exit. Right? It's about the question of uh, preferential, because preferential exit, exit under unequal conditions isn't you know, benign withdrawal uh, uh, in pursuit of autonomy, but it, it's, it's effectively a kind of form of, where one could see it potentially as a form of class warfare. The last point I'll make is just this, freedom as equality, freedom and equality. So a different libertarian, uh, Mikhail Bakunin, famous Russian anarchist of the 19th century, he said socialism without liberty is slavery and brutality, right? Totalitarianism. But the inverse also, liberty without socialism is privilege and injustice, right? And this is the sort of critique of libertarianism uh, in its market variety that one might make. Um, if Bakunin is too radical proposition, you could go to someone like Jean-Paul Sartre, a French philosopher, uh, who said we're condemned to be free. Uh, essentially, we're social beings, we're condemned to be free, and from that obligation, there, there is no exit, as one of his most famous plays uh, put it. And I'll stop there and be happy to take questions, and thank you for your time. Okay. Don't go far, okay. All right, thank you so much, um, Ray. We really appreciate, uh, it was a very interesting talk. Uh, we will have 20 minutes for questions. Uh, recognize a few of you may need to leave to other classes before we end today. Um, if you have a question, I just invite you to, to come over to this side of the room. Feel free to rest against the wall if someone's in front of you, that's fine. Um, just introduce yourself by saying your name, um, your role if you're a student and what you're studying. Um, and we'd love to have a, a lively discussion. And as you're thinking about that, I just have one question uh, to kick it off, which is that, uh, you know, I, I think I'm not alone in uh, recognizing, you know, moments in my life where I've wanted to flee society as well. I think this is a, a common human desire uh, to, to leave and to try something new. So many of the uh, projects that we usually think about that historians have spent more time on tend to be more utopian experiments, right? Where you leave, but you leave in order to create a more equal society, or you leave to create a, a different kind of society. And um, my question to, to start us off is this. Um, was that ever an, an aspiration, right? To actually increase levels of equality uh, in this group of people that you're, you're studying. And in the end, um, did they ever feel good about what they accomplished? Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Um, should I should I answer that first? Yeah. Sure. Go ahead. Sure. And, yeah. And if you have uh, ideas, come on. Up. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, that's a wonderful question. So Michael Oliver's still alive. He's ninety. Uh, he's ninety-five. Um, we've had a number of phone conversations. Uh, not not easy phone conversations, but we've had a number of phone conversations. And um, you know, he's the first one to say to me that there was nothing utopian about what he wanted to do. Right. It was not about utopia. It was about a better form of governance versus a, first, a worst form of governance, right? Um, and he regretted uh, putting a lot of his efforts into these things, or that's what he said to me in the aftermath, kind of, it didn't come to fruition, these things didn't succeed, and so he, uh, he felt like he would be, you know, he gave a lot of interviews with People Magazine, Reason Magazine, very, very important uh, libertarian magazine, and he felt like he would be remembered for these projects. Um, and I wanted to take him very seriously, uh, you know, he's been, um, he's been either sort of, you know, celebrated or ridiculed, and I just wanted to kind of try to understand where he was coming from and, and make sense of his projects. The question about the utopian projects, um, I think there's two things I would say. One is, is that uh, I have no doubt that for the majority of people that I'm looking at here, uh, they firmly believe, uh, you know, that one can make an argument either way, but they firmly believe that freedom in the market 
will yield equality. Right? I think that's, I think that's a, uh, Murray Rothbard was the one exception here. Murray Rothbard called egalitarianism or equality a, um, uh, I can't remember the exact phrase he used, but it was, it was pretty bad, it was pretty demeaning. He, he called it a kind of totalitarian discourse or something like this. But for everybody else, I mean, the, they, they had a sense in which that you established the freedom for people to have these kinds of autonomous, sovereign, contractual relationships, and out of that, it'll yield equality, right? So it's a sequential argument. Freedom first, equality comes uh, in the wake of that, um, versus, you know, uh, arguments that you would find on, uh, on parts of the left, which is, is that, you know, freedom and equality must come together, it must be simultaneous, not sequential. So that's one aspect of, I think, the, the question. Uh, the other one is, that, yes, there are lots of experiments that, so one of the things I talk about in the book briefly, but don't talk about in the talk today, are other forms of what you could call exit societies, but I end up calling them exilic or exile societies because I couldn't figure out how to, um, I had to think about a term so that I could differentiate them. But the Zapatistas of Southern Mexico are a good example here, right? I mean, they're in this kind of bargaining relationship with the Mexican state. They are mostly indigenous people who feel that they have been completely cut out of any kind of benefits from the state. They want to be distinct from the state. They've set up their own autonomous territory. But it's one rooted in a politics of mutual aid and cooperation rather than competition. It's one that tries to uh, excise itself not only from the Mex Mexican state, but also from uh, the market system, right? They have a very, very uh, strong critique of international finance, of Wall Street, of the Mexican state's relationship, its extractive industries, and so forth. And so uh, those, I think, I'm not even sure I'd call those utopian either, uh, but I think they have a kind of uh, a different sensibility uh, about them. So I hope that yeah, helps. So thank you for the question. Yeah. Hi. Um, hello. Uh, my name is Caleb Harding. I'm studying computer science. So I'm a student. So I was curious what role, if any, you might see like immigration playing in this topic. If, for example, you know, in the future, a group of a large group of people immigrate to a state and then kind of change the structure if it's a democracy through just voting or I don't know, something like that could be possible. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, yeah. So a couple of good examples of that happening now. Uh, one was the the uh, call to have a large number of people migrate internally to New Hampshire, to the state of New Hampshire, right? Uh, and, and to essentially resettle there by 2020, right? This was the sort of um, idea. And there's a very good book uh, on this called uh, When a, a, a Libertarian Walks Into a Bear, right? Because there's this big dispute around bears in New Hampshire, and it's about, it's about this movement of people. Um, and so the, prem the premise was, in fact, to, you know, to move to New Hampshire and set up a kind of uh, libertarian uh, society. And there's even a sort of backcountry burning man in New Hampshire. It's, uh, I can't remember the name of it, but it's sponsored by the Koch Brother Foundation, Reason Foundation. Um, and so that's one example, right, is, the, is to actually the internal migration. A uh, second example is um, there's a group of, uh, you know, pretty savvy, pretty interesting uh, Silicon Valley um, tech folks who have put together a plan exactly like you're suggesting, which is to kind of run an algorithm, right? So you input all the kinds of things you want, average yearly temperature, tax rates, uh, access to airports, uh, quality of the food, uh, zoning laws, and so on and so forth. You put in a whole bunch of things that are your preferences, and the algorithm will spit out good places for you to potentially go. But you don't go by yourself. You go with a group of people who share, right, who have the wealth and also have the same kind of aspirations you have or the same sets of criteria you have. Once you get there, you negotiate with the state, right? You negotiate with that state in question for all different kinds of possible kind of rearrangements for you vis-a-vis -vis that state. And the idea being, right, that you're going to bring sort of investment money, you're going to bring people, you may start to work remotely from, you know, it's a lot of this. So that's, a, um, that's another example uh, of this. Um, and then the last thing I'll say very quickly is the, um, the case of Honduras, you know, is a, is a kind of counterexample here in which you have individuals, for example, Roatan Prospera, the island uh, of Roatan, where there, there's an effort to build um, uh, one of these economic development zones that'll be kind of private and uh, with ceded land, uh, you have, you know, a number of people, uh, very few of them Honduran, um, in many instances, I mean, maybe only one or two who are Honduran, uh, 
who are going to come and get a whole array of new sovereign protections, right? They're not going to give up their citizenship elsewhere, right? But they're going to come and, and, and they're going to get a whole new set of sovereign protections while Hondurans are being stripped of all protections, right? Mm -hmm. They're fleeing the country. They're going to be completely at the whim of narco traffickers in Mexico, of you know, the things they're going to encounter when they get to the border of the United States. So you have, you have on the one hand, right, people being stripped of the possibilities of meaningful citizenship. Um, and then on the other, you have, right, this kind of ability to live, you know, duty free, so to speak, right? Uh, yeah. Awesome. So well, thank, you. thank you for the question. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Hello. My name is Savannah Levitt, um, and I'm a political science major. And uh, climate change is something that has always really interested me, and I am uh, wondering if you can talk more about what you said about how if the wealthy have um, a preferential exit option, you said, how would that affect our ability to address climate change? Yeah, so, you know, the reason I raise that is part of it is the, the question of how people become motivated, right, to find certain kinds of solutions. So find, you know, I guess the, the sort of most direct path to an answer would be um, rather than, uh, you know, flying a rocket in, into the stratosphere for 16 minutes, I mean, maybe Jeff Bezos could I invest in meaningful, right? Um, and so, you know, or Musk or, or Richard Branson from Virgin. Um, and so that, uh, that's, that's part of it, is just the, the, the question about where the resources, the extractivism, the, uh, the extrusionism, right, that sort of outpouring of pollutants, the things that are actually not working to mitigate climate change, and at the same time are sort of not mitigating climate change, they're worsening climate change, but at the same time providing constantly this possibility, right, to, to potentially escape. I mean, I don't believe, no, no one's gonna colonize Mars or the moon anytime soon. I mean, it takes 800 people to keep one astronaut alive in space. So you know, it's a fantasy. But on the other hand, there's an enormous amount of investment in these things, uh, which in, in some sense, if you need, it, the response to climate change has to be a response by a collective, it's gotta be a collective and it's gotta be experts, you know? Um, and so that's the, that's the kind of argument that I, that I am building up from, from Mike Davis. There is, um, you know, someone who's very interesting that's written about this from a slightly different perspective, Jeffrey Frieden, uh, wrote recently very uh, persuasively, I think, in many respects, even though I disagree with him, he wrote very persuasively about exit as a moral right. Uh, but even he says in his conclusion that, mo that exit cannot be a moral right until everyone has equal capacity for the possibility of exit. You know? And so it's, it's a fascinating argument that's a little bit different than mine, um, but, but I think goes to also to your question. Yeah, thank you. thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah. I'll squeeze one oh, in. I'll squeeze sure. one in very quickly. Right, right Hi, Paul Carey in the History Department. Hi. Appreciated this very much. Thank you for coming out to BYU. What about the, 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 the non-speculative side that, that you were writing about. I was glad you, you captured that. It seems to me when I look at these, and I think they sometimes self-style themselves as micro countries, um, they seem to, to exhibit maybe not utopianism or, or to even come out of this political thought area, but almost um, individual creativity, realization of the self, especially the digital micro countries, one yeah. that has no territorial claim, right. but where they say, here's a a virtual space that we can right. operate in. Yeah. Uh, maybe speak just a little bit to that and, and, and this self-realization. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it's not a surprise that one of the inspirations for, for some of these projects has been Burning Man, right? I mean, the, the, the sort of festival of, of art and self-realization in the, in the desert. And, um, you know, and I think there's, I, it's important. I think it's important to recognize, I mean, no one would want a world like where you didn't have the kind of capacity you know, to imagine differently and to be different, right? And, um, and so, um, you know, Teal himself, I think Teal's own, uh, uh, y you know, his own relationship to society uh, and his time at Stanford University and others, you know, dramatically impacted how he thought about what it meant to be, to be able to be who he is. 
Um, and so in that sense, right, I think the, the, the self-realization component of many of these is, is fundamental. Um, the thing I always come back to is that you know, Burning Man, just, just to take that example, I'm sorry, it's a sort of easy one, but it's a, it's a remarkable um, thing, but it's expensive. And it's not, in my opinion, a model for a sustainable long-term society, right? Um, and so how then one sorts of squares those things? I mean, I think the digital spaces you're talking about are, are a little different, right? And I think those are places where people are able to kind of forge notions of community, forge certain kinds of uh, um, uh, ways to relate to others that, that don't require the kind of you know, analog sort of stuff that I'm looking at here. The thing that concerns me with these projects is the, is, well, there's lots of things, but I guess to sort of strip it down, I mean, the venture capitalist meets colonization component is just hard to, it's hard to turn off. Um, it's just hard to see past that. And um, whereas something like, you know, digital utopias or experimenting with different kinds of forming community that think about territoriality, sovereignty, extraterritoriality in very different ways, you know, I think that those are fundamentally or qualitatively different in some sense. Yeah. Thanks for the question. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Hi. Hi. Uh, my name is Noel and I'm an economics major. Hi, Noel. Um, so I know you've already addressed kind of like these like micro economies and cities throughout the uh, Roata and Prospera, uh, but I have just like a couple more questions and, you know, I'll try not to layer it too deeply. So um, I guess like with these, you know, micro kind of societies that we can say, you know, ideally, is there any sort of integration within, you know, the country they're residing? For example, like how are they interacting with the market and economy of Honduras? Are they right. doing... Um, I lived in, in, in Honduras for a time, uh, not in the northern region. So I know Roatan uses uh, dollars instead of the traditional yeah. lempira, such as uh, Honduran currency. So are they like it trading, interacting with other countries or micro economies, or is it kind of just like all internalized? Yeah, it's, it's a very good question, and thank you for that. Um, it's not entirely clear, uh, and I think part of the reason it's not clear is because they're in motion. Uh, and so the seasteaders for example, had a memorandum of understanding with the government of Tahiti uh, that fell through after about a year, in part because of huge protests in Tahiti um, by folks in Tahiti not wanting a, a, a fixed platform in one of the lagoons off the, off the coast. Um, and I think the seasteaders over time have been a little tone deaf about, about how they come across, right? And so they've now modified uh, their, their language to take into consideration things like this how much local labor will they employ, right? Uh, how, what kinds of sort of mitigation uh, will they do in terms of environmental impact? And so they've started to kind of fine tune the way they see themselves in relationship to what, this is unfortunate that they use this terminology, but they, they call it the host society, right? Which of course immediately means that everybody's like parasites, you know? I mean, it just, you know, so it's a kind of unfor unfortunate language. But they have, they have, started to recognize, right, that they have to sort of track out in advance if they want to have any chance of succeeding what that kind of relationship, economic relationship, is going to be like. They have to show statistics about the kind of money that they're going to be able to bring in, how it will go into the local economy or not, and so forth, right? Um, in the case of Honduras, it's a little different, I think, because the Zetas are designed uh, in, in some sense as a, a way to pattern or model a completely different governance structure, right? What the relationship is going to be with the Honduran government is entirely unclear. You know, uh, the Zedes prior to the recent elections, the Zedes were being pushed very strongly by the Honduran administration of Juan Orlando Hernandez, whose entire family had been convicted for narco-trafficking, and his connections with narco-traffickers are very clear. Uh, incidentally, Rhodes and Prospera would not have an extradition treaty with the United States, right? I mean, you know, it's not coincidence. Uh, but what that economic relationship would be is very, very unclear. And the role that narco-trafficking money plays here is, is crucial, right? I mean, it's a you know, multi-trillion dollar business. Um, so, yeah, so there's not, a, there's not a kind of fast answer for that, but, um, but it's a good question because I think the, there's, um, there's this kind of awareness of trying to sort of think through uh, 
what that relationship is going to look like. Another example here, just last one very quickly, are the, the so-called Portopians, right? Brock Pierce and, uh, and, and uh, early Bitcoin purchasers who went to Puerto Rico after the hurricane, right? And they got the governor's ear. They managed to get the governor to kind of be on their side, and they wanted to privatize the, you know, the, the, uh, the infrastructural, right, the electrical system. So, and so that didn't go anywhere either, but there was this brief moment, a flurry of activity. I mean, when you get an article, full, a full-blown article in Rolling Stone about you, you know you're making progress. And that's what happened with Brock Pierce, right? I mean, the whole thing about him and the kind of Puerto Rican um, aftermath of the hurricane. But, you know, a lot of people see this as disaster capitalism, right? Um, and so the resistance is very strong. Do you mind if I ask a follow-up question? Sure. Yeah, please. Yeah, That's, I know. I know we're like straying away from the term like host society, um, but in these countries where are you know there are these experimental societies, what do you think are the biggest takeaways and lessons, you know, that these countries should be you know looking for and observing that they can perhaps integrate within their own economies? Yeah. Um, well, you know, I'm I'm pretty dubious of the exit. Uh, strategies. Uh, and so I tend to come back to, uh, you know, uh, I guess I'm not a little bit of a traditionalist in, in this sense. Um, but I think the, the, a good example would be the current administration of Chile that just was elected, right? Uh, they're completely reshifting what the meaning of sovereignty means for Chile, why you need to rewrite the constitution that was created by a dictatorship in 1980, why you need to rethink the relationship between society, the state, and the market, uh, and what that, how you do that without just, uh, in some sense or another, blowing everything up, right? I mean, there's been this big concern about Boric and others um, uh, kind of just dismantling uh, the market system entirely, and it's clear they're not going to do that, and it's clear they couldn't do that. And same with Morales in Bolivia. I mean, you've had a lot of places, right, trying to navigate exactly this, but these kinds of projects, to, to my mind, uh, don't have an enormous amount, it seems to me, to offer in the end. Right? I could be wrong about that, um, but it's still, to my mind, I've yet to see or kind of look and think to myself, right? I mean, you think about the classic free trade zones um, that have been set up, right? And, you know, Shenzhen and China and, you know, uh, you think about Hong Kong or the nostalgic vision of Hong Kong that people have. It was never quite as, as happy, I think, as, as it sometimes made out to be, you know, anti-union and so forth. Um, but, or Nauru in the Pacific. I mean, there are these, these places that have been set up as free trade zones, and the consequence of those free trade zones are mixed, right? It depends who you talk to and, and what, how they're structured and how they're operated. Shenzhen is interesting because it's, it's a relationship with the Chinese government, right? But Nauru, I think, is different, yeah. Okay, right. yeah, thank, you. thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks very much.